What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and welcome to the divisional round of my weekly NFL pick show for the 2017-2018 NFL season, the 2018 NFL playoffs, and we are knee-deep in it right now. We had really successful picks in the wild card round. Let's talk about those and do a little housekeeping before we get into the picks for the divisional round. Wildcard weekend, as I said, pretty successful with the picks on the four games that we had last weekend. Straight up, we went 3-1 and one picking the games last weekend, which has us, of course, 3-1 and one for the playoffs. And hey, that's halfway towards a winning playoff season. As there's 11 games, you only have to get six right to be over 500. And in the playoffs, you know what? Worst case scenario, we'll take it. 3-1 and one straight up. Two and two against the spreads. We got a couple of them wrong there, but we got a couple of them right. And three and one on the over under, bucking the trend from the regular season just a little bit. On the AFC side, the number three Jacksonville Jaguars defeat the number six Buffalo Bills 10 to three. That was a straight up win for me, as I told you to take the Jags. We lost it against the spread. I told you to go Jacksonville minus nine, and we had an inexplicably, incredibly low scoring game where Jacksonville really did not look good. So that does not work out. Buffalo covers plus nine, but it was an over under win. I told you to stay under. 39 and a half points. I just thought Jacksonville would have more of them. And on the AFC side as well, the number five Tennessee Titans come back and shock the number four Kansas City Chiefs 22 to 21. And that was our one straight up loss, as I told you, to take Kansas City to beat what I felt was a vulnerable Tennessee Titans team. It wasn't against the spread win. I told you to go Tennessee plus nine. I knew Kansas City wouldn't blow them out. I just expected them to beat them. And it was an over under win, as I told you to stay under 44 points. And this was mwah, just perfect. It gets to 43. Matter of fact, the score I gave you in that game, I believe, was Kansas City 23, Tennessee 20. So I actually got the exact number of points that would be scored in that game. Tennessee just scored a couple more than I thought they would. On the NFC side, we had the upset of the playoffs thus far. The number six Atlanta Falcons, of course, it's an upset unless you listen to my episode. The number six Atlanta Falcons go into Los Angeles and beat the Rams, doubling them up, in fact, 26 to 13. I knew the Rams were vulnerable. I knew they made a mistake with sitting their players in week 17, and it did come back and bite them in the ass. It was a straight up win. It wasn't against the spread win as I had Atlanta plus six and a half in that game. They win it outright, but it was an over under loss. I told you to go over the 48 points in that game. They only get to 39. And the other game on the NFC side, the number four New Orleans Saints at home beat the division rival Carolina Panthers, the number five seed, for the third time this season. A very difficult thing to do. They beat them 31 to 26. That score looks a little closer than it should have been. The Saints were kind of got caught napping that Christian McCaffrey, the last touchdown for Carolina, making that game close once again. Game ends on a sack of Cam Newton. It was a beautiful thing for someone that loves defensive football. It was a straight up win for me. It wasn't against the spread loss as I told you to go New Orleans minus seven in that game, but we did get the over under as it goes over the 48 and a half points. Taking a look at the Bridgewater's Finest and Hatbox Pick'em Pools for Season 6 of my show and Year 4 of Hatbox's Pool. In the Bridgewater's Finest Pool, I now sit in 6th place out of 35. That is up 2 spots from last week. 1,492 out of 2,106 possible confidence points. That is a clip of 71%. And on Wildcard Weekend, I did my job. I brought in 28 out of the 40 confidence points available. That's a clip of 70%. The game that I did miss was the Kansas City game, which was my 12-pointer. Shout out to our Wildcard Weekend winner, me. I, in fact, pulled off the victory this week, which is exactly why I said I did my job. I had a 3-1 and record this week with 28 out of 40 confidence points for 70%. Three other people in the league also had 28 out of 40 confidence points, but those were all on records of two and two. And what have we been saying all season? Straight up record is the tiebreaker. I had a better straight up record. I'm giving the win to myself.
More than a teal and remains our overall leader in the pool, 1,546 out of 2,106 possible confidence points. That is a clip of 73%. I believe it's a 1% drop from last week, but that really is just in the math and the rounding. Nice Pats fan also has 1,546 confidence points still, so they remain tied in terms of confidence points, but Nice Pats fan still has a worse straight-up record than More Than a Thielen does, so right now, More Than a Thielen remains in first place. With only 80 total confidence points left to be won, all but the top 10 have been mathematically eliminated from winning the overall. That doesn't mean you have to stop making your picks, continue to make your picks, maybe slide up into the top 10 would be a great place for you to finish. In the Hatbox Pick and Pool, I am now tied for sixth place out of 39. That is a plus one movement from last week where I was tied for seventh with 171 correct straight up picks out of the 260 games played between the regular season and the playoffs, that is a clip of exactly 66%. It's pretty close to where you want to be. You want to get closer and closer to that magic 70, but hey, two out of three ain't bad. And on wildcard weekend, I brought in, of course, three of the four games correctly. That's a clip of 75%. On wildcard weekend, four teams in the Hatbox Pick'em Pool had the exact same record as me, so it's me and three others at three out of four for 75%, and all four of us share the victory on wildcard weekend. Rel Eagles Fly remains the overall leader, 179 games picked correctly out of the 260 games played so far. That's a clip of 69%, nice, and that's exactly where you want to be. With only seven games left in the playoffs, all but the top five in the Hatbox Pick and Pool have been mathematically eliminated from winning the overall. And unfortunately, that includes me. I'm mathematically eliminated, but I'm going to keep making my picks in that league with the hope that maybe I might slide up into the top five, and that's a heck of a place to finish. So, shout out to myself, more than a Thielen, Nice Pats fan, the four teams that went three and four, and Rel Eagles Fly for either winning wildcard weekend or remaining the overall leaders in the pools. And I'll take the opportunity, as always, to remind you that if you go to the description of the YouTube video or the description of the audio file on SoundCloud or iTunes, what are you going to find? You're going to find all of my results from the regular season as well as results from last week. You're going to find all of my straight up against the spread and over under plays for the divisional round. You're going to find information on joining the Bridgewater's Finest and Hatbox Pick'em Pools for season six and year four respectively. It is not too late. You can get yourself shouted out on the show if you have a perfect week you would be in there. So it's never, never, never too late to join the Pick'em Pools. You're going to find information on joining the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Facebook page. Again, all your favorite progs are there. Videos are being posted constantly. Content is there. Polls are there. Discussion boards are there. There's the Discord. There's all kinds of great stuff going on on the NFL YouTube Prognosticators page. I would make the argument... One of the largest prognostication communities on YouTube is on that page. Click that link in the description and make sure you join us. You're going to find information on subscribing to the Hatbox Nation YouTube channel. Uh, I haven't been doing my piece of content, so I've been uh, really slacking off. We may be close to shutting it down for the year. Billy may continue with his videos. I hope he does. But you're going to want to be there next season because next season, it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get better. Make sure you subscribe to the Hatbox Nation YouTube channel. And you're going to find information on Nerd Tees, nerdtees.ca. You use the promo code BWFINEST. You're going to save yourself 15% at checkout. That's nice. You're going to get free shipping on any orders over $50 in Canada. For Canadians, that's nice. For Americans, you're going to get the bump on the American dollar, which is doing pretty well right now. That's pretty nice as well. Make sure you go to nerdtees.ca. There's something there for everyone, for every taste, every palate. There is something there. Nerdtees.ca, promo code BWFINEST. Yesterday, I finally received my championship ring from finishing first place in my own Dynasty Fantasy Football League. That's a league that a number of my listeners are in, a number of my subscribers, good friends of mine are in that league. It's a 12-team league, 
And in the first year, just the first year of this new Dynasty League, I won the championship. I've got my ring. Shout out to Fantasy Jocks for this incredible championship ring. I posted it on Facebook. I posted it on Twitter. Make sure you get on there. Take a peek at that. It is a great little piece of hardware. And I look forward to defending this championship next season. Bring it on to the other 11 managers that looks like everybody's coming back. So what an incredible, uh, just again, it was so much fun this season. And I can't wait for next season to defend this crown. Bring it on to my other 11 cohorts. But yeah, I got this ring and I absolutely love it. Fantasy Jocks didn't pay me anything to say that. I just like shouting out quality product. If you are the commish of a fantasy football league, you want to get into prizing, there's no better place to go, man. Make sure you hit up Fantasy Jocks. All right, folks, damn it, it's time. NFL division round predictions for the 2018 NFL playoffs. Let's do this like last week. We're going to start in the AFC. In the divisional round in the AFC, we have a five versus one matchup of the Tennessee Titans traveling to New England to take on the Patriots. And we have a three versus two matchup working as intended. The Jacksonville Jaguars now having to hit the road and go to Pittsburgh to play the Steelers. We're going to start at that 1v5 matchup, Tennessee traveling to New England. The Patriots are 13 and a half point favorite in this game with the total set at 47. Via their victory in the wild card round, Tennessee now 10 and 7 on the season, the second team to come out of the AFC South into the playoffs, now 9 and 4 against AFC opponents and 4 and 3 on the road going 500 in those games now or above 500 rather on the road. New England, on the other hand, 13 and 3, the number one seed in the AFC, first place out of the AFC East. They were 10 and 2 against AFC opponents this season, going 5 and 1, both at home and on the road. We talked about the Titans on offense last week, the number 23 total offense in football, number 23 by the pass, number 15 by the run, and the number 19 scoring offense in football. Last week in the wildcard round against Kansas City, they put up 397 yards of total offense, 195 through the air, and 202 on the ground on the back of Derrick Henry, putting up 22 points. And aside from the run game, there's really no way of accurately comparing these two teams on the offensive side. The New England Patriots, the number one total offense in football this season, number two through the air, Tom Brady, of course, having another incredible season. But they're only the number 10 run offense. Now that is top 10, but 10 versus 15, it's not a huge jump. So as far as the run offenses go, these two teams are pretty comparable. But not really in all other terms, including points being put on the board. New England, the number two scoring offense in football this season. Defensively, Tennessee, again, we talked about them last week, the number 13 total defense in football this season, but just number 25 against the pass, which is terrifying going into a game against Tom Brady, but they were the number four run defense in football, so it's going to be a hard run go for the New England Patriots. They were the number 17 scoring defense in football as well, were the Tennessee Titans, and in wildcard weekend, they gave up 325 total yards 256 through the air to Alex Smith and the Chiefs, only 69 yards rushing to Kareem Hunt and the Chiefs. That is a good mark. If they can duplicate that this week, they got a better chance, and they allowed 21 points on the board. And on defense, I mean, look, these Patriots are far from impregnable. They're certainly what you would describe as probably the prototypical bend but don't break defense. And you'll see that in the rankings as we go over them here. New England, the number 29 total offense in football this season. That is, what, fourth worst in the NFL? Number 30 against the pass. So as bad as Tennessee has been against the pass this season, New England statistically has been even worse. Tennessee, a far better run defense as New England is just number 20 against the run this season. But the difference is points on the board, and that's what really matters. The New England Patriots, a top five scoring defense this season, only number five. Your average game between these two teams just heads up on the season, points scored versus points allowed. Your average game is going to look something like New England 25, Tennessee gets to 20. 
put the game in New England like it is this week. New England at home, Tennessee on the road. Scoring goes up a little bit. New England 27, Tennessee 22, still that five-point breadth. And in the last four games overall, straight up for New England would be the last four games of the regular season. Tennessee, the last three of the regular season, plus last week. The Patriots, 3-1 and one in those four games, would score about 25 points. And Tennessee, 2-2 two and two in those four games, would score about 20. So it stays that five-point spread. Storylines heading into this football game. I mean, look, Derrick Henry. I think I might have even said it last week. It's to Tennessee's benefit if Derrick Henry is the feature back in this offense. I hope that's the case for their sake this coming week. Derrick Henry against Kansas City. 25 total touches and 191 all-purpose yards. That is an incredible playoff game. But again, what happens if DeMarco Murray plays even in a limited role. Speaking to Keith Bailey, my Tennessee Titans guru and fellow NFL YouTube prognosticator, he seems to believe that DeMarco Murray will play. Now, the majority of the other NFL YouTube progs, I believe, don't think he will play. If he does, even in a limited role, again, I don't think it's to Tennessee's benefit whatsoever. Derrick Henry is the guy in this offense. He needs to be the bell cow. He needs to be a three down back. That is Tennessee's best path to trying to at least keep this game close. The other thing I'm kind of thinking about, like, does the narrative of, and this is an active narrative kind of in the NFL community, the narrative of New England has the easiest path to the Super Bowl. And people have said it, high people have said it, like high ranking people have said it, people with influence in sports media have said it, that they have the easiest path to the Super Bowl. Does that have an impact on how the Patriots go into this game? Because it's hard. And I mean, look, they're obviously, they're kind of used to it comparatively because they get so much coverage across the country good bad and indifferent but so much coverage so i guess maybe they're used to kind of blocking out stuff like that but when people say that it's hard to not take that seriously especially when do we know if belichick's coming back next year uh, is brady going to retire after this year josh mcdaniels is likely going to be interviewing for a bunch of head coaching jobs again like he was last year so it's like does all these things have an impact on how the Patriots go into this football game. As far as I'm concerned, I hope not. I don't think so. I think they're good enough as a franchise and they're put together well enough and they have enough faith in this coaching staff that something like that is not going to get in their way. I, honestly, I don't think Tennessee has much of any chance in this game whatsoever. I'm going to go New England 34, Tennessee 20. That's New England winning straight up, New England covering the minus 13 and a half at home. If the game was in Tennessee, I probably wouldn't give them that, but I think they're going to cover in a game that goes over the 47 point total. That's New England, Tennessee. The other AFC matchup, as we talked about, the Jacksonville Jaguars as the number three seed now have to hit the road and go to Pittsburgh, play the number two seeded Steelers. Pittsburgh favored by seven and a half points in this game, in a game that has a total set at 40 and a half. That is the lowest total of the week, but it'll be understandable when we talk about the defenses. Jacksonville, via their win last week, are now 11-6 on the season, the number one seed out of the AFC South, champions of that division. They're now 10-3 against the AFC and have a 4-2 mark on the road against AFC opponents because, of course, they played at home last week. The Pittsburgh Steelers, 13-3, First place out of the AFC North, number two seed in the whole NFC, or whole AFC, sorry. 10-2 and two this season against AFC opponents, and have an equal mark of 4-2 and two at home. The Jags, we talked about them offensively last week. The number six total offense in football, number 17 by the pass, the number one run offense in football, and a top five scoring offense at exactly number five. Last week, they only put up 230 total yards against the Buffalo Bills, and only 75 of them came through the air. I saw this statistic, and I think it's true. Blake Bortles had more rushing yards than he did passing yards, and that is worrisome. <laughs> that is, uh, if, if you're a Jags fan, terrifying, I would say. 75 total yards through the air, 155 total yards on the ground, and that's what you like to see. That's what you expect to see from the number one run offense in football, but they only generated 10 points on the Buffalo Bills in their own building. That is troublesome. 
especially when you're up against the Steelers, the number three total offense in football this season. They were number three also through the air. Obviously, huge credit to Antonio Brown, who we'll talk about here in a second. They're only the number 20 run offense in football this season, which is shocking when you have Le'Veon Bell. So you can't really compare these two teams in terms of their results running the football but very comparable scoring offenses. We said Jacksonville was number five. Pittsburgh was number eight. So very, very close. On defense, Jacksonville talked about him last week. Number two total defense in football. The top secondary in football. Only number 21 against the run. And that was the real weakness of the Jags defense this season was the run defense. And that's something that Pittsburgh can very easily exploit with one of the best backs in football. But Jacksonville, the number two scoring defense in football, and they certainly showed it in the wild card round against Buffalo. They gave up 263 total yards, so they were actually out yarded in that game against Buffalo. Only 133 through the air. That makes sense with that good secondary. They did give up a buck 30 on the ground to a less than 100% LaShawn McCoy and the Buffalo Bills run offense. That is definitely troublesome, but hey, Buffalo could only generate three points off of it. Now we look at the Steelers, number five total defense in football. So again, this is a matchup of two top five defenses on the season. It's two top five secondaries, as Pittsburgh was also number five against the pass. Steelers just barely stayed inside the top 10 in terms of total run defense this season. The number 10 team on defense against the run. So markedly better run defense than Jacksonville this season from a statistical perspective. And it's a battle of two top 10 scoring defenses as Pittsburgh had the number seven scoring defense in the NFL. You take a look at the average games here between these two teams. Doesn't look too good for the Pittsburgh Steelers in large part due to Jacksonville's incredible defense. Heads up on the season, points scored versus points against. You're looking at Jacksonville 23, Pittsburgh 21. Put the game in Pittsburgh like it is this week. Jacksonville still comes up with a victory, but the margin of victory lowers to just one point while the score goes up just a little bit by about a field goal. Jacksonville 24, Pittsburgh 23. And even in the last four games overall, where Pittsburgh's 3-1 and one and Jacksonville's only 2-2, two and two, including the win that they had last week against Buffalo, it's still a slight edge for Jacksonville. Score goes up a little bit again. Jacksonville 25, Pittsburgh 24. All of these things are troublesome for the favored Steelers. Storylines heading into this game, I think, are pretty obvious. At least the top storyline should be pretty obvious. Um, Antonio Brown has the most important calf muscle in the NFL right now. You're not doing your job if you don't at least ask yourself a few times how effective can or will Antonio Brown be against Jalen Ramsey and that incredible, incredible Jags secondary. We go back to that week five matchup, the 30 to nine victory in favor of the Jacksonville Jaguars. In week five, Antonio Brown caught 10 balls for 157 yards. That is great yardage. He did not find the end zone in that game and he was targeted in that game 19 times which means he only brought down about 50 percent of his targets a little better than 50 percent in that same game jalen ramsey had seven tackles most of them on antonio brown he had an interception that he brought back for 15 yards and ramsey had a season high four passes defended so say what you want about the run games and the run defenses, whatever. That is going to be the matchup. Antonio Brown against Jalen Ramsey. And it's Antonio Brown on a wonky calf muscle that maybe he shouldn't even be playing this game. But come on, let's be honest with ourselves. We know he's going to be playing. The other major storyline I'm looking at here, in his 14th season, Ben Roethlisberger has to play one of his best games in order to get over the hump here, get back to the AFC Championship game. We go back to that Week 5 matchup, the game that Jacksonville won by three scores. Roethlisberger threw for 60% and threw 312 yards against this incredible secondary. That in and of itself, if that was the whole story, that's not too bad. But it was the five interceptions that he threw in that game. Two of them coming back for pick sixes. 
That's the story from that game. After that game, Roethlisberger in an interview said, you know, geez, maybe I just don't have it anymore. You're talking about a secondary that can cause a Super Bowl winning quarterback to say, geez, maybe I just don't have it anymore. So if the Jags can play like that again, it is going to be a rough go for the favored Steelers. We've gone back a couple times now and talked about that week five game, but I want to hit you with a number here that I'm going to try to use at least to justify why I'm taking Pittsburgh in this game. I like Pittsburgh 17, Jacksonville 13. And here's where I'm coming from here. It's not just the performance last week, which I thought was by and large garbage. Jacksonville should have curb stomped Buffalo in that game. Here's why I think this is a problem. Obviously, now you're talking about Jacksonville, not in their own building. They have to hit the road. This is a Jacksonville team that over the past three seasons prior to this one had won exactly two road games in three seasons. They're coming off of road seasons of 1-7, and 1-7, and seven, and 0-8. Oh and eight. I've talked for years about how the Jacksonville Jaguars don't know how to win on the road with consistency. Now, they did that this season. They won on the road. They won on the road a lot. Four and two against AFC opponents. That's great. But we're not talking about the regular season. We're talking about the playoffs. The playoffs are a different beast. Jacksonville had an incredible turnaround this season. And you know what? Played incredible defense and they knew how to win on the road. I don't think they know how to do it in the playoffs because they've never had to because it's Jacksonville. What are the playoffs? Based on that and that performance against Buffalo, I can't justifiably take it. We're going to take the Steelers here, 17-13 at home over Jacksonville. So we like Pittsburgh straight up, but I do like Jacksonville to cover that seven and a half point spread. I think that's a little disrespectful to a Jacksonville Jaguars team that's been so incredible on defense this season and pretty damn good on offense too, especially given that, again, Jacksonville beat them in week five. But we're going to go Jacksonville plus the seven and a half points, Pittsburgh winning the game straight up in a game that stays under the 40 and a half point total, which has been slowly creeping down. It was 41 and a half. It was 41 last night. Now this morning it's 40 and a half. If you like the under, you might want to bet that game now before it gets any lower. Let's go over to the NFC side now where we have the David versus Goliath matchup, at least by rankings. The number six ranked Atlanta Falcons traveling to Philadelphia to face the number one seeded Philadelphia Eagles. And you also have the number four New Orleans Saints traveling to Minnesota to take on the number two seeded Vikings. Let's go back to David versus Goliath here. Atlanta at Philadelphia. And for the first time in NFL history, a number one seed goes into a division round matchup as an underdog. Atlanta on the road, favored by a field goal, in a game with a total set at 41. And I'm sure there are a ton of Philadelphia Eagles fans that are pissed off by the fact that they have to play this home playoff game as an underdog. Atlanta, by virtue of their win last week, now 11-6 and on the season, the third team out of the NFC South to make the playoffs this season, one of them in Carolina, already gone. Atlanta now 10 and 3 against NFC opponents and an excellent 5 and 2 on the road against the NFC. Philadelphia Eagles for their part 13 and 3 this season, the number 1 seed in the NFC, champions of the NFC South. They were 10 and 2 against the NFC this season with a mark of 5 and 1 in their own building. We talked about Atlanta on offense last week, very balanced, number eight total offense, number eight pass offense, number 13 by the run, and the number 15 scoring offense in football right around middle of the pack. Last week in Los Angeles, they put up 322 yards in total, 198 through the air, kind of a low mark for Matt Ryan, but a buck 24 on the ground. They did their job in the run game, generating 26 points. The Philadelphia Eagles on offense, pretty damn good across the board. The number seven total offense in football. So we got the battle of eight versus seven in terms of total offenses. On the pass, 
number 13 in terms of total pass offense on the season, but the number three run offense in football this season, an excellent mark between LeGarrette Blount, Jay Ajayi, and some other players, but the number three run offense in football, leading the way to the number three overall scoring offense in all of the NFL. But we're going to kind of come back to that point because there's something I want to talk about in the storylines once we get there. On defense, talked about Atlanta last week, the number nine total defense in football, number 12 against the pass, number nine against the run, and number eight in terms of scoring defense. Last week against the Rams, one of the top total offenses in football, top scoring offenses in football, they only gave up 361 yards in total. Gave up 246 through the air. Not terrible. If you give up under 250, that's a pretty good game. Buck 15 on the ground to Todd Gurley, which is not great, but certainly could have been worse. But they only gave up 13 points. So they bent, but they definitely did not break against one of the best offenses in the NFL. The Philadelphia Eagles put together a hell of a defensive performance this season in their own right. They probably have the edge here on the defensive side. Number four total defense in football, only number 17 against the pass. So Matt Ryan is going to have options and is gonna be able to exploit this secondary more so than I think Philadelphia is gonna be able to exploit Atlanta's. Philly was the number one run defense in football this season. That's where you start. If you stop the run, it gives your secondary chances to pin their ears back and make some plays. The number one total run defense in football and the number four scoring defense. So this is a battle of two top 10 scoring defenses. Your average game between these two teams, mm, boy, it doesn't look overly close, does it? Just heads up, points scored, points given up. You're looking at an average game of Philly 25, Atlanta 20, which is the exact same gap as we had between New England and Tennessee. Put this game in Philadelphia, the gap gets wider because Philly's defense really balled out at home. The Eagles 26, Atlanta 18. Now you're talking about a fully converted touchdown to make up the difference. But, and this was the case with Atlanta and Los Angeles last week, if you look at the team's last four games, which for Philly would be the last four games of the regular season, and for Atlanta, the last three plus last week. Both teams are 3-1 and one in those four games, and it's 21-21. to 21. It is dead even. It is a dead heat. It's a coin flip. Storylines for me heading into this game, and we got one on each side, one for each team, that kind of makes me nervous about both teams and their ability to win this game. We're going to start on the Atlanta side, and we talk about how the playoffs are a different beast. I fully believe that. I 100% believe that, both as someone who was an athlete earlier in my life and having watched as much sports as I've watched. The playoffs are different. People play different, people react different. It is a different beast. And the playoff mentality, which is a thing that I also believe exists, I think goes a long way to shutting out some of the things that may have more of an effect on you in the regular season than they will in the playoffs. I think across sport, I think that's universal. So we got this playoff mentality that I think mentally shuts out some of those trends and things that might lean on you. But this is going to be Atlanta's fourth road game in five weeks they had back-to-backs close to the end of the season finished the season at home last week on the road this week on the road four road games in five weeks and it's also their third straight road game against a team that made the playoffs that is a murderer's row and eventually something like that has to start leaning on you I realize as the number six seed, if you're going to win the Super Bowl, you probably got to win four road games. So I understand that. But in Atlanta's case, if they want to win the Super Bowl, they would have to win what? Six road games in seven weeks? Just un absolutely unreal what Atlanta's going to have to do to climb that mountain. And even to climb the mountain this week, four road games in five weeks, it's incredible. But here's why I think they do it. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I like Atlanta to win this football game. I'm going to give it to the Falcons 24 to 20. And here's why. My second storyline, and this is the one against the Eagles. So, starting in week 15, obviously week 14, 
Eagles, Rams, Carson Wentz has the injury. He's done for the year. So we're going to start in week 15, 15, 16, and 17. The Eagles averaged in those games just 18 points per game. It was under 18 points per game, in fact. Had them the number 21 scoring offense in the NFL in that time period. They averaged 259 yards per game of offense. That was fourth worst in the NFL in that time frame, number 29. Those games were against the Giants, the Raiders, and the Cowboys. None of them playoff teams. All of them worse scoring defenses. And two of three of them worse total defenses than Atlanta. Atlanta and Dallas were like, decimal points away from each other so they were basically tied those numbers were down from 31 points per game and 390 yards per game from weeks 1 to 14 with Carson Wentz that was good for number one and number three in the NFL so they dropped 20 spots in terms of points per game and 26 spots in terms of yards per game Obviously, smaller sample size, only three games. Not the point. The point is, you can't even begin to compare the Philadelphia Eagles on offense with Carson Wentz and the Philadelphia Eagles on offense with Nick Foles. And that's nothing against Nick Foles. But that, to me, I think is the greatest argument to be made that Carson Wentz was the MVP. In my opinion, the Eagles losing Wentz is no different than the Packers losing Rodgers. Only difference being, I think Nick Foles, I don't think, think this is pretty well objective, Nick Foles is a more capable NFL quarterback today than Brett Hundley is. And that's certainly not a stretch to say that. Nick Foles can win this football game. I just don't think he's going to. We're going with Atlanta. I like the Falcons, 24 to 20. Straight up, obviously I like the Falcons. Against the spread, I'm going to take that Atlanta minus three in a game that goes over the 41 points. All right, folks, last game on the docket, and this is the one that I've gone back and forth on the most along with Pittsburgh-Jacksonville. We're talking about the number four New Orleans Saints traveling to Minnesota to take on the number two Minnesota Vikings. Obviously, Vikings hosting the Super Bowl this year, so they obviously are very invested in getting to that football game. Vikings come into this game favored by four points at home in a game with the total set at 45 and a half. New Orleans, via their victory last week, now 12 and 5 on the season, the number one seed out of the NFC South. They are 9 and 4 against the NFC this season, and this is where I need to make a correction when I was talking about the Saints last week. And we're going to scroll all the way down here. I said last week, that New Orleans was 8-4 and four against the NFC and 4-2 and two at home. I was incorrect, obviously, in saying that. They were 8-4 and four against the NFC, but at home, in fact, they were, uh, what is it, 6-0? and oh? I think they were undefeated at home against the NFC this season because despite being 9-4 and four against the NFC, all four of those losses against NFC opponents came on the road. They're only two and four away from home against NFC opponents this season. So now they'd be seven and zero at home against the NFC. So I apologize for that correction on my part. The Minnesota Vikings, 13 and three on the season, the number one seed out of the NFC North, number two seed in all the NFC, 10 and two against NFC opponents this season, including five and one at home. The New Orleans-Carolina game was the most exciting game of the wildcard round, and you'll see that when we talk about the yardage that was given up in that game. On offense, we talked about New Orleans last week. Number two total offense in football. Number five through the air. Number five on the ground. Number four in terms of scoring offense. Top fives across the board. In the Carolina game, Drew Brees and the Saints put up 410 yards of offense. Drew Brees and the pass game responsible for 369 of those 410 yards. Only 41 yards of offense on the ground for the New Orleans Saints. So despite the fact that they lost and soundly lost the running back battle, they won the football game. They generated 31 points off of that yardage. 
The Minnesota Vikings in general on offense this season, hanging around the bottom of the top 10, middle of the top 15, just kind of, you know, high end middle of the pack in terms of offense. They were the number 11 total offense in football this season and number 11 through the air. They were inside the top 10 in terms of the run, the number seven total run offense, which means this is a battle of five versus seven on the ground. And they were just at the bottom of the top 10 at number 10 exactly in terms of scoring offense. On defense, Saints, we talked about them last week. Again, very much middle of the pack. Number 17 total defense, number 15 against the pass, number 16 against the run, but they did perform higher than their statistics in terms of the scoring defense just at the bottom of the top 10 at number 10. In that Carolina game, eh, that kind of went out the window. They gave up 413 total yards. 306 through the air, a buck seven on the ground, so a very balanced attack from Carolina, and they gave up 26 points, but they did enough on offense to win the game. And then you look at the Minnesota Vikings on defense, and it's just not even fair to compare the two. Number one total defense in football, number two against the pass, number two against the run, and the number one scoring defense in football. So we got the number four scoring offense going against the number one scoring defense. That is what this matchup is. Your average game between these two teams, straight up points scored, points allowed, it's a dead heat. Minnesota 22, New Orleans 22. Put this game in Minnesota, Vikings defense balls out a little bit more. Minnesota 22, New Orleans 20. And take a look at the results from the last four games overall, last four games of Minnesota's regular season, last three games of New Orleans' regular season, plus the wild card game last week. They're both 3-1 and one in those spans. Minnesota 23, New Orleans 20. So as you can see, the more situational we get, the more it's kind of leaning to Minnesota's side. Storylines heading into this football game for me. Let's look at one on the Saints' side, and it's the Saints' running back game on both sides of the ball has got to break through. And I said this last week, it didn't work out, but they still won. They're playing a different defensive beast this week. So they can't do what they did last week and expect to win. It has to break through. Ingram and Kamara combined last week. Number one, only touched the ball 21 times. They need more touches. On those 21 touches, they only gained 68 all-purpose yards. That's barely over three yards per touch. That needs to be better. Alvin Kamara did score a touchdown against Carolina. That's good. It's points on the board. But the yards per touch and the touches have to go up this week against Minnesota. On the flip side, New Orleans defense gave up 208 all-purpose yards and a touchdown to Carolina's running backs plus Cam Newton. You always, of course, have to worry about Cam Newton taking off and running the football. You don't have to worry about that this week. The Minnesota Vikings do not sport a mobile quarterback. It's Case Keenum. I think he had 15 rushing attempts all season, so that's about one per game. You don't have to worry about that. Keenum is a pocket passer. He's looking to make the pass. So in terms of how you play the quarterback, QB spy, he ain't going anywhere. My other storyline here, and this was a big stat for me, and this is what really makes me concerned about the Minnesota Vikings. Since 2011, no quarterback who's making their first playoff start, which is what is the case for Case Keenum. It's his first start in the postseason. No quarterback making their first playoff start has beaten an opposing quarterback with 10 or more playoff starts, which is what Drew Brees has. In 2011... That was the Tim Tebow in overtime game against Pittsburgh. And they only won that because it took overtime and a touchdown pass from an illegal formation. Yeah, I went there. That was an illegal formation. Fight me. It was an illegal formation. That's a tough road to hoe. Case Keenum is going to have to buck that trend. He's going to have to beat a Super Bowl winning quarterback. He's going to have to beat an elite offense. He's going to have to beat a good defense. I don't think the Vikings can just lean on their defense in this game as they have for certain games through the regular season. And that, I think, is what New Orleans has to do. New Orleans has to dedicate stopping the run. If they stop the run and force Case Keenum to beat them, I don't think he's going to do it. 
This is an upset, folks, and it's going to make Geo very mad at me. I'm going to take New Orleans. Make no mistake about it, this is my least confident pick this week. I'm going to take the New Orleans Saints to go into Minnesota, despite all the reasons that I kind of said that Minnesota is probably the favorite to win this game and probably will win this game. I'm still taking New Orleans. I got a feeling about this Saints team. I really do. New Orleans 23, Minnesota 21. So we're going to take New Orleans straight up. We're going to take New Orleans plus four against the spread. We will take those four points in a game that stays under the 45 and a half point total. There you go, folks. Those are my straight up against the spread and over under plays for the divisional round of the 2018 NFL playoffs. We will go over them here with you one more time. On the AFC side, 1v5 matchup, Tennessee traveling to New England. I like the Patriots to win that game 34 to 20. New England straight up. I like the Patriots to cover minus 13 and a half in a game that goes over 47 points. And in the 3v2 matchup of Jacksonville traveling to Pittsburgh to take on the Steelers, I like the game Pittsburgh 17, Jacksonville 13. I like the Steelers to win the game straight up. Jacksonville plus seven and a half on the spread in a game that stays under the 40 and a half point total. On the NFC side, six versus one, I'm going to take David to beat Goliath one more time. I like the Atlanta Falcons to beat the Eagles 24 to 20. Let's take Atlanta straight up, Atlanta minus three against the spread in a game that goes over the 41 point total. And then in the four versus two matchup, New Orleans traveling to Minnesota to take on the Vikings. I like New Orleans 23, Minnesota 21. That's New Orleans straight up, New Orleans plus four against the spread in a game that stays under 45 and a half points. There you go, folks. Those are my straight up against the spread and over under plays for the division round of the 2018 NFL playoffs. It is time for the patented and coveted comment of the week. My comment of the week from the Wild Card Weekend episode is going to go to Seth Gunderson, who makes a revelation in the comments this week. Seth Gunderson says, first of all, Seth Gunderson, I believe, was a fantasy player and was in a number of my redraft leagues for years and years and years. I believe his name was Gundertakers or something like that. I believe was what it was. Correct me, Seth, if I'm wrong. Seth Gunderson says, I'm more than a Teelan. Starting off right there, our champion, so far our overall leader, gracing us with his presence in the comments section, which is awesome. I'm more than a Teelan. And I think that nice Pats fan tying me for the lead foreshadows a Vikings versus Patriots Super Bowl. <clears throat> I mean, my response to that obviously was man, awesome to see you like Gundy. Oh my God. Awesome to see you. And I'm totally down for that Super Bowl matchup. If I'm wrong about that Vikings game, I'm totally down for the Patriots and Minnesota in Minnesota for the Super Bowl. That would be an incredible atmosphere. I just got a feeling about the Saints I reserve the right to be wrong, as always. Seth, I also reserve the right to say to you, thank you, and yours is the comment of the week from the Wild Card Weekend episode. All right, folks, that is it for me. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, the division round picks in the books. I hope you enjoy the games. I'm going to miss the games on Saturday because I'm going to be recording something special for you guys. I can't wait for you to check it out. I'm actually going to announce it on Twitter tonight. Make sure you're around to check that out. In fact, I believe Matthew Parker is the only person that knows what it's going to be. Anyways, enjoy the games this weekend, especially the games on Sunday that I'll get to watch. But enjoy the games. We will see you again for the AFC and NFC Conference Championships next week. It is getting down to the wire. I can't wait to see who we're going to be picking between.